Great. Thank you everyone for coming and who watches later. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So um, Bro is a little center in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. It's almost a hundred years old now. <clears throat> and we're hoping soon, well, we are having Dan soon, who will be in person. It's been a long time since we've done much in person. It'll be great. And just want to say hello to everybody and thank you for coming and tell you a little bit about Dan. He is a nature-based consultant, skilled mentor, a bird language expert, and a certified wildlife tracker with over 30 years of experience. He's been doing it since he was 10. He has an MS in natural resources and served as science faculty at Granite State College for a decade. He's contributed to wildlife studies, served as a science and audio editor for the book, What the Robin Knows. We had John come to row. Uh, you may know him from his Learn a Bird series on YouTube and Instagram TV <laughs> or his bird mimicry skills, wow. They'll definitely be coming to you at Row. He's the founder and principal of Lead with Nature based in Southern Maine. Dan, welcome. Thank you. I'm going to highlight you now. And we will be enthralled by what you say. Thanks, everybody. Um, just scrolling through these places. And in my mind's eye, I'm journeying to, you know, Quebec and St. Paul and Doylestown and right across the road here in Berwick, New Hampshire. Oh man, all sorts of places. This is exciting. So thank you for sharing uh, your time and for bringing your attention and interest to, um, to tonight. Uh, my intentions here are to share a little bit. Um, you know, I was talking to Arthur who organizes a lot of the programs here at Roe and um, this is the first time I've formally partnered with Roe. So it's always fun and new and interesting having new collaborations. And it's like, we got to come up with a name for it. And I was like, okay. And then there was this video that one of my local bird uh, TV stations did calling me the bird whisperer. And I was like, sure, let's do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't think there's anything special about, I mean, it's wonderful and special in some ways, but there's nothing truly unique about being able to have communication and relations with our wild neighbors. Like that is a in act inherent um, capacity we all have. We all have the ability to be in, in connection and contact with everything around us. So, um, but I like to talk about it. I like to try and practice it and share it with other people. So tonight, I'm just gonna do a bit of that and share a little bit of my story and how I do it. And hopefully, um, you know, that'll stimulate some, some discussion and some interest. And so um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, share a little bit of a slideshow and a little bit of some stories and a little bit of make some sounds and maybe there's a little video or two here and there. We'll do that for about 35, 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll have some time for some Q and A um, as well as um, just making sure folks know that we're really excited to be able to offer an in-person long week or weekend program at Roe coming up here at the end of uh, the end of April and early May, which is a fabulous time because it's not like insane peak bird migration, it's still manageable <laughs> numbers of species because making connection with our wild neighbors actually can be a little overwhelming when there's too, too many of them. And for anyone who showed up here tonight who's is a fellow bird nerd like me, you can get easily distracted by all sorts of colors and sights and sounds. So we tried to pick a time when there should be a lovely assortment of birds, but not too many in my judgment. So, um, yeah, so there's a little bit of that. So we'll get going here. I just want to point out here right behind me, these are some of my neighbors. And I like to think about birds. These are, uh, anyone might recognize these birds, pretty cool, interesting bird that nests way up in the Arctic. Yes, nice, Jan. Um, Jan talked, these are the Harlequin ducks and Harleys as we call them, winter here on the Southern coast of Maine in the rockiest, gnarliest, foamiest sea as you can imagine right there next to them. And that's where they make a living. And I remember when I first started watching these birds, um, I'm not always the world's most empathetic person, but I try. Uh, I remember thinking, God, they must be so cold and miserable. Like, you know, we're out there and we're freezing, trying to watch these birds and the winds blow and it's winter on the coast of Maine. And then I was like, wait, they're actually not getting wet. <laughs> um, 
the beauty of the feathers, the structure, the design, the the body of of many of our wild birds, especially our our, our waterfowl, is they have this absolutely amazing amazing beautiful coat of feathers that keeps them warm and dry as long as they maintain those so really the only parts of them are their little feet and a little bit of their bill that's getting technically wet and um that just made me that just little observation really made me pause and be like well what else am i assuming about birds what else am i assuming about mammals what else am i assuming about trees what else do i make what other kind of assumptions do i make about what i like to call the more than human world that are probably inaccurate are probably limiting and are probably blocking my ability to have connection with them. So that's also part of my journey. And that's part of what I like to do with folks is, is try to like, just bring a little bit of awareness to that and give us opportunities to maybe pop those little bubbles or those assumptions or let them go or test them out and see what happens after we do that. All righty, let's see, here we go. If you have questions that are going along here, please don't be shy. Pop them in the chat, and uh, they will be carefully curated by Fia, and we will address them um, later on. I'll keep an eye on them as best I can, but I will be yapping away here quite a bit, so um, I probably won't be able to respond in real time, uh, just, so you, uh, just so you know. <clears throat> All right, so how to be a bird whisperer. I'm still learning that. Uh, <laughs> and it was great when Fia and I just uh, met. We just met 10 minutes ago. The first thing she told me we were talking about was she was in the woods hand feeding nuthatches and chickadees. So we've got a couple, at least a couple of bird whispers in the room, probably many, I have a feeling. And I don't know exactly what that means, but really, you know, my journey, uh, which is just mine, um, is one of trying to understand my role, my place, my connection in this big, beautiful, wonderful, complicated, challenging world at times. And so what I like to do with birds, because they're, they're awake when we're awake, they make songs, many of them, um, that we tend to find appealing. They're often colorful, right? We share the daylight hours with many of them, not all of them, and they tend to grab our attention. And in many ways, our attention is probably our most one of our most valuable assets, and in some ways you could even call it a commodity these days. But that is really what we're talking about tonight, is what do we do with our attention? So if we start right off, just this is this is one of my first kind of base assumptions. Consider this. Birds are communicating to us as well as everyone else. It's not like they're like, oh, humans, look at me, I have this great story to tell. But our wild neighbors, the other things on this planet are often communicating all the time. And we are part of the part of the world they're communicating with. And we can understand them. And many of you may already know this. For some of you, this may be review. For some of you, this may be brand new. For some of you, this may seem like a bunch of hogwash. For some of you, it may seem really basic. So I invite all of that. But they are communicating. And we are part of that communication. And we can understand them which is exciting. And as soon as we're ready to give them our attention, this happens. Because when we're not giving them our attention, they're still communicating. We still can understand them, but we're not hearing it. Today's a great example. I had a little bit of a challenging interaction with one of the people I love the most in my life, one of my offspring. Um, uh, and I got all moody and group about it and blah, blah, blah. And I walked outside, go get some firewood to get the house warm. It's a cold day here in Southern Maine. And I just kind of like dump, dump, stomp out the door, walk down the steps, go to the woodshed. And I'm not even listening. I'm not even paying attention because I'm here. I'm in my little story in my head and I'm worried about my child and I'm frustrated about our interaction, yada, yada, yada. That's fine. That's what it is to be human sometimes. But as a result, I didn't even notice that there were uh, way up high above me, there were ravens making crazy noises. Uh, a couple of different ravens. <laughs> this really wacky raven stuff going on. No clue. And, and then like all of a sudden, as I like pick up the, the hat, the ax to split some wood, I hear it. Like it catches up with me. It's kind of like someone's talking to you. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, someone's talking to me. And so I just pause for a second and I look up 
and all of a sudden there's the raven, uh, there's not two ravens. This one just swoops right down below the other one, starts diving and kind of tumbling. The other one starts go tumbling behind it, and they're just having a blast up there, my judgment. But I've watched ravens a lot. They're having a good old time playing in the sky, and it just made me stop and smile. And it just pulled me for a second out of my own little human trauma, drama, griefy story, right? And that's okay. Like <laughs> It was like, oh, thank you. That's beautiful. And I just stood there for a minute and watched them. And they dipped over the horizon. They were gone. Split some wood, brought it in. I wasn't ready to give them their atten my attention until I was. And then I did. And then I'm like, huh, what is that bird saying? Like, what is that bird communicating right now? And to me, in that moment, it was joy. And it was pleasure. And it was to be alive, right? My interpretation. But it's a communication. And it's also playing with its friends, its family, its neighbor. I don't know exactly who it is. I don't know them well enough. But there's that. So I just want to share a tiny little bit of background about me since I don't know most of you. Um, and you might be wondering, who's this guy? Uh, so um, I really like birds. I like a lot of things. I like people. I like a lot of the world. And um, I grew up, um, my background, I grew up uh, down in New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore, not the actual TV show, but the real shore in a small little town that got crazy in the summer and was really mellow in the winter. And um, I was lucky enough to meet a mentor in my high school years who have a special gift to get people excited and connected to nature by just asking a ton of questions. And I was a curious person. And I responded well to that mentoring style. And I got really excited about learning about the world beyond the human world. I got excited about learning about things I had no clue about. Because I grew up in like class, a pretty typical suburban neighborhood. And, you know, I, no one in my family was crazy about nature per se. You know, my dad was a city boy. I grew born and raised in Brooklyn, New York City, you know, uh, first generation immigrant. You know, my mother was from Newfoundland, Canada, and spent a lot of time outside. But, you know, more kind of out of practicality than anything else. And um, so I didn't really understand and appreciate a lot about nature until I had someone who was a guide for me in many ways to help me do that. And so that's one of my one of my favorite people, uh, John Young, who is a fabulous friend and, and mentored me for a long time. And we worked on this book together. Some of you may know um, what the Robin knows, which is to begin it, trying to share a little bit about our experience with what we've learned from paying attention to birds and how birds can reveal the secrets of the natural world. Now, this book is nothing new in the world. <laughs> Most everything else knows this. Most other species are conscious of this. And in many cultures around the world for many, many, many thousands of years, some recently, some in the past, also understood this. But we put in a book, and I think it's pretty good. <laughs> and it's interesting, and I encourage you to check it out. So, um, that's later on, you know, but really what for me happened was someone like challenged me and brought my attention and curiosity to birds. Someone to be like, huh, what's that? Wonder what that bird's saying, or what's that bird over there? Or what's happening with that? Whose nest is that? And I just did well with trying to figure things out. I really liked challenging uh, myself to see and find and seek out birds, right? I really liked to find the things I didn't understand. I really liked to try and learn more. Um, you know, I had some books and stuff, um, which are great. You know, one of my aunties kind of gave me a, a field guide and an old pair of binoculars. And, and that was awesome. Uh, the book, I didn't quite didn't quite make the connection. And, but eventually, like looking at all the pictures, I was like, oh, I want to see one of those. And I remember I saw that picture of a great horn owl in the Peterson field guide book. I was like, that would be the coolest thing to see, like for my mind. Well, also a great gray. But I thought that's probably not realistic in suburban New Jersey. So I remember wandering around the woods being like, how do I find an owl? <laughs> I just want to find an owl. And since I was really young, I was always a mimic. I always made lots of noises for better, or for worse, um, to some people's humor and other people's uh, disdain. Uh, <laughs> it drove a few people crazy. But going looking for an owl, um, I realized, um, <clears throat> and it probably was I'm not sure how I even figured it out, but I realized that crows and owls didn't get along. Whenever 
crows would be going crazy. Usually I learned there was something else making them go crazy. And I didn't understand the concept of mobbing at the time where certain birds will tend to go around birds they don't like and they'll make a racket and they'll try and scare them out of the area. So I didn't understand that, but I knew something about crows and it had something to do with owls. So I started just following crows all over anywhere I could. If I heard crows making a racket, you know, our typical crow kind of vocalizations, right? We think about like, or they all have different accents. So depending where you are in the country, right? Or really structured calls, very similar, like very stable. But then when you hear crows go to really unstructured and kind of like almost intense or uh, erratic call, like, then you're like, whoa, something's going on. And at a gut level, we know this stuff, right? This isn't shocking. Like our DNA, our lineages, no matter who we are, no matter where we're from on this planet, like our people all live close to the land for a really long time. And when birds made alarms, when birds caused a racket, we paid attention. And many of us still do, right? So we've got like, we've got the hardware. We're designed for this, right? And if we've forgotten it recently, like, well, we just need a little bit of an update or an upgrade and then we're ready to go. So that was my story too. Like I, like at some level I understood this but I just needed some structure and guidance to help me do it more. So that's kind of how I started to get into this and that got my curiosity going. <clears throat> and the other thing I just want to say is like, I'm just me. Like I just, you know, some kid who grew up in like middle-class suburban New Jersey and, you know, white, great male middle-aged guy now like i got my own limitations and biases and i try and pay attention to those too but they are what they are um so there's a little bit about me so this is my you've been warned slide this is not a bird mimicry lesson <laughs> i had a couple of people email me saying oh you're gonna teach people how to mimic birds and I was, on that webinar i was like mm, not really sorry that's not what we're gonna do i do have a youtube a uh, video called How to Mimic Bird Sounds, which is a decent start uh, if you're interested in that uh, on my Lead with Nature YouTube channel. This, to become a bird whisperer, as we're calling it, I just want to say this does require quite a bit of work. And it also requires for many of us changes in behavior. And changes in behavior are very difficult <laughs> for many of us, myself included. And often, the more we've been around, the harder it is for our behavior to change. So, I just want to acknowledge that that's real. It also could take a really long time to embody um, and to bring to their, our consciousness. Even though, like I said, we do have the hardware, it's in there, like getting the other stuff out of the way, I will say, <clears throat> be able to really focus, to be able to put our attention towards, in this case, the behaviors, the body language, the sounds, the energy, the intention of birds like this one in the slide on the right, right? Like just that, you know, the shape, the silhouette tells you something. If you're a bird or it gives you a name or a family. If you're a behaviorist, if you're someone who follows bird behavior language, you're like, hmm, what's that bird thinking? What's that bird doing? Why is it posturing in that way, right? But this stuff takes a long time and it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of like going out and trial and error and following birds around and watching birds and listening to birds and seeing why they're doing what they're doing. It's doesn't just happen overnight, right? And the best part though, is that journey, um, and it continues, <laughs> continues for me all the time, is that it's full of beauty and wonder. It's full of challenges too, but it's mostly full of curiosity, beauty, and wonder. And it doesn't stop, really doesn't. So best part, just keeps going. <clears throat> so let's meet a few of our neighbors as we start to learn about some of these little tips. Some of you may know Raven, some of you may not. In the Mountain West, Raven is a classic city bird. I mean, it's a bird you'll find roosting over bus stops and pooping all over, uh, you know, people standing there. <laughs> it's super troublesome and, and you know, even in some parts of the country, it's very rural and wild and in the mountains, you know. But Raven is my neighbor, one of my neighbors, uh, maybe yours too. And I just like ask, like, what are your assumptions about Raven? So if you feel like popping something like that in the chat, like, what, are, what do you think? <clears throat> when you think Raven, what comes up for you? When you think harder, what do you just assume about birds in general? 
Raven's an interesting one for this. What might Raven, or really any bird for that matter, how might they teach us to be a bird whisperer, right? Because while I was really fortunate to have a human mentor, there's no doubt the most important teachers for me have been and continue to be my wild neighbors, including the birds, but not just the birds. If the birds just lived in a little bubble with nothing else out there, they, there wouldn't be much to learn and they wouldn't be very interesting. So it's mink and marten and fox and weasel and raccoon and skunk and um, snakes. And I mean, it's all, it's, it's everyone and oak trees and yeah, elderberry bushes and everything. They're all part of the same story and they're all teaching. <laughs> they all have something to share for us, right? So yeah, a few people have to say, yeah, smart, aggressive troublemakers, uh, trickster, smart, communal, many, many tale, trickster tales about Raven, shapeshifter, messenger, magical. Yeah. So I pick Raven for a number of reasons. And one of them is that um, one of the lenses that I see through is the modern scientific, Western scientific lens. It's one that shaped a lot of my uh, upbringing and in, in my collegiate years and all that kind of stuff and teaching in a college setting. It's not the only lens I use though. And one thing I hear again and again is like, oh, ravens are really smart birds. And I would agree. Um, but I do think that's like, it's half, that's only half a story. Like, I think we call ravens smart birds because ravens have understood how to pass and flourish on tests we've created for them based on things we think are smart. <laughs> but any bird that's alive today from the house sparrow that's picking the crumbs off your scone on the, you know, in an outdoor cafe to the starling flock over the highway to a pigeon in a parking garage to a prothonotary warbler and a scarlet ibis are all brilliant. Brilliant, magical, amazing survivors. They are mass, they're, they're just like, they've made it this far because hundreds of thousands of generations of their ancestors have been wise enough to survive in the face of innumerable challenges, right? So there's a wisdom in just being, there's a wisdom in being alive. And especially for a lot of our wild neighbors that is hard for us to understand sometimes. Um, so yeah, Raven is totally smart and brilliant and hilarious and social communal and trickster and freaky funny. Um, I got in a, a yapping match with a Raven last week a friend was visiting and we went for a walk out in the woods and we came back and we stopped at a spot and I heard this raven coming over and I just started making weird noises. <laughs> yeah, and it swooped down and started going <laughs> making all these noises back and we were just having, I don't know, it was just messing around, having fun. It didn't seem to, you know, it, it's making noises back and then it kind of paused for a second, looked up in the tree, flew over us, turned around, <laughs> turned back, went the other way. So raven's fabulous, but I just want to also invite you to think like, well, what if we just started with all birds are smart? What if our assumption was all birds are really smart, regardless of what we think about how we can test them? And then from there, until they prove us otherwise, let's just assume they're all brilliant. Turn that on its head. What does that do to our relationship with them? All right, so bird whisperer assumptions. Here they are, here's a handful. Animals are paying attention to each other very closely, as often as possible, and it's really important. They're relying on each other for their well-being, right? They're relying on each other to find food, to find shelter, right? To be safe, to have community, right? And most humans today have forgotten how to pay attention, like all our, a lot of our wild relatives. Not all, but many many of us, myself included for a long time. But we can understand and talk with other animals in this way when we start to listen and tune in and give them our attention. So those are just some assumptions that I wanna get out of the way. Here's a scene, many of you, especially if you're anywhere in the range of the American goldfinch or maybe a lesser goldfinch out west, um, you, you could see, right? This is a charm or a 007. Those are two of the collective nouns uh, we have for for our goldfinches, <clears throat> which is hilarious. Um, 
So the goldfinch is one of our most common social chatty birds. Fascinating critters. Uh, come to bird feeders. A lot of people have familiarity and connection with goldfinches, right? Yeah. By all these little beautiful little twittery songs, and they're just lovely. Most people, there's very few people who are griping about goldfinches in my experience. So I chose to stick some goldfinches there, right? And this time of year, they're feeding on, where I live, they're feeding on poplar buds, they're feeding on birch seeds, they're feeding on whatever they can, because it's still cold and snowy here. In other parts of the country, they're on other things. So I just ask, what might the priorities be in a goldfish community? Okay. What are their values, right? What's most important to them? I don't have that answer. I'm not a goldfinch, but um, <clears throat> let's assume they understand such things. Let's assume, and they may understand something even more interesting and 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 uh, <laughs> than that. But at the very least, by watching them a lot, I can tell you they definitely have some priorities. I can tell you they definitely value certain things. They definitely have practices in common. They definitely work together as teams, right? They definitely look out for each other. Definitely communicate quite a bit. And they're pretty dang good at taking care of each other. All right. But if we're start, if we want to start learning how to be a bird whisperer, how to start to interpret this language, one of the lenses I like to look at it through are what are the practices it takes? What are the practices we need to embody, we need to start to take on in order to in order to do this, in order to truly you know, to, to get more understanding. And I'm, you know, there's other ways to understand this. This is just how I've done it over the years. This is how I've shared it. This is how I've taught this for, you know, and it's evolved, but for decades, these are things that I find that stick. They still stick year after year. And the first one is probably the most important one. And it's always a good one for me to hear. And I have a huge sticky note right in front of me that says this, slow down. <laughs> Right. One of my good friends, and she had her first daughter. They're visiting some. Fa they're visiting family, and, and I think the daughter is maybe a year, year and a half old. And the family member is wonderful, thoughtful, caring auntie. I was like, oh, we, you know, there's this, you know, she wanted to show her some like little kid video, and this family was not really into that at this point. And, and, and she looked at the window and she said, you see that snow coming down over there? And it was like this like kind of fast falling snow. She's like, that's about as fast as we kind of put things in front of her right now. <laughs> like that's, that's it. We're not gonna go to any fast like kids videos at this point. And I thought that's an interesting approach. So when we slow down to the level, the speed, and it's not always slow there, but when we, and really slowing down means tuning into our senses and kind of giving our minds a little bit of a break, a little bit of a pause. This is what we might call mindfulness. This is what we might call meditation. This is what we might call being or breathing, but it's a really important first step. In order to listen, we need to slow down. We need to stop talking and to tune in. And we need to use the senses we've got. And I don't know what they all are. We all know the basic ones that we learned, but we probably are, many of us are aware that there's others that we can't even necessarily put words to, but we all have intu intuitive senses and we all have expanded senses. We need to use those. And we need to assume that other, other neighbors, other animals, other wildlife are aware of us. Like we're not just operating in this little bubble. When we, you know, when we are sharing a world with them, they are generally my assumption is that most of them are paying attention to us most of the time. That assumption all of a sudden makes us like, all right, who's watching me? Who's listening to me? Who's checking on my behavior? Who's responding to the way I'm doing something or not doing something? And when we do that, we have an opportunity to engage, right? An opportunity to engage with wild neighbors because we know they're there and we know they're paying attention. So here's a Fun little example of how we might not be paying attention. A newscast from LA about 10 years ago. Very short. Watch 30 seconds in. Marco yeah, in South Sky Five. Uh, uh, well, this this is very interesting. 
Apparently, the Bears yeah, decided to right, you know, move around. All the garbage cans are out, too. Mm, yeah, just something. a couple of minutes ago, the Bear left the clearing in the backyard there, and he made his way over to the driveway over on Mayfield. He came down that driveway, down Mayfield, and now, now he's on look to the now right, like pan right. Turning into another driveway here. We're going to kind of maneuver around and see if we can get another shot of him. Um, but, uh, yeah, he would definitely. Oh, right uh -oh, there. Uh -oh, okay, man. Someone, uh, resident. Yes, man on cell phone, head down, no clue, sees Bear, freaks out, runs away. So, <laughs> you know, I just like to think about how we treat our wild neighbors and, and where are we putting our, our, our awareness? Where are we putting our energy, right? Where are we putting our attention? <clears throat> so for me, it's helpful to, have, to think about some practices, right? So we just talked about slowing down. That's our first practice, right? Slowing down and making time for the more than human world in our lives, whether that's sitting by a window where you know there's some birds nearby or going for a walk in a park, um, whatever it may be, slowing down and creating space in your life is going to be the first thing to even listen and understand what birds are saying. This also stops the needless disturbance of birds because most of what we do most of the time is disturbing to birds. And we often don't think about that birds have agendas too. Like they're just not there to entertain us. Like they're trying to eat. They're trying to uh, take care of young. They're trying to take care of themselves. They're trying to stay warm. They're trying to take care of their feathers. Um, a variety of things. And we often will just plow right through them unconsciously, myself included when I'm not paying attention. Um, but if we slow down, we can decrease the, the chances that that's going to happen, right? And that also lets us get closer to other things. Because when we disturb birds, we send out a ripple of disturbance on a landscape, and that pushes other things away from us. You may, be experiences, you may have experienced this with people, be, being both the cause of a disturbance or reacting to a disturbance. When someone comes into a place, who is disturbing others, you see a, a, a ring of energy. You see ripples going away from that person because people don't want to engage, right? So we have this opportunity to pay attention and stop this unnecessary disturbance and therefore have neighbors nearby that we can be connecting with and learning from. And that also speaks to our mind, right? Because when we slow down the mind, like I said, and we slow our pace, that gets us closer, right? Closer to all sorts of things. So this is Bobcat. I don't know if you've met yet. She's very, very observant. <clears throat> she does a lot of sitting and listening. She's a great teacher for slowing down. Like most wild cats, she spends a lot of time chilling. <laughs> she's a listener and a looker, right? And she's very careful about how she uses her energy. So there's some little things in there for, for all of us at times. You know, what might we learn about Bobcat, uh, learn from Bobcat about the birds? Because right? Bobcat also needs birds to survive, right? She needs to be eating birds as well as mammals and other things. So she has, she's invested in paying attention and watching behavior and being able to predict things, right? So she can live, so her kittens can live as well. Our next practice is just to use our senses, right? Is to actually use the senses we have been given this, and to continue to work on developing those senses in some way. So I like to think before you arrive, before you, before you open a door, before you step out of your car, before you have any sort of transition, use those transitions as little like, like little points of, um, of awareness, right? Like, boom, okay, well, I'm about to do this. It's just a great idea for situational awareness too. So you're not just like stumbling into things. If you're about to go through, enter a place, leave a place, just go slow, look around, what's happening, gather information. I right? think about even, I know it's not kosher anymore, but when I was a kid, we used to let our cat, we had a house cat, we used to let it out all the time. It probably was slaughtering birds left and right. What did I know? I was a kid. But when I let that cat out, cat outside at night and I opened that little door, it would always just step two steps out and then just sit there and it would wait. I remember watching it like, what is it doing? You know, and it would wait five, 10, 15 minutes. Let its eyes adjust, ears totally pricked up and paying attention before it would go sneak, sneak out into the night and cause uh, havoc <laughs> in my backyard community. But that's part of the wild senses. That's part of what it means to stay alive. So even things like just some breathing, right? Taking that breath letting it go, sending our listening out around us. These are helpful ways to get into our senses, right? And beyond our senses, 
we have our feelings. We have so much knowledge in things we can't even sometimes articulate. And I'm a person who's very much trained in science. And I also taught and shared and had experiences of my own for so long, watching people, literally watching people where I'm out trying to learn from birds and like I'll, something will happen. I'll watch them go and like look and turn and watch it and then go back. And they'll ask them about it and they'll say, oh no, I didn't see anything. And I'm like, I watched, this is amazing. Like, this has happened so many times. Like we're not even aware of the ability of our senses. We're not even aware sometimes of what we're taking in, right? Because there's other things getting in the way. So feelings are important to pay attention to, right? Emotions are important to pay attention to, right? It's part of our, part of our sensory input. This one evokes emotions to some people. <clears throat> you might hear a little, um, or <clears throat> especially if the, uh, the missus is around. <clears throat> if you're east of the Mississippi in North America, you may be familiar with Tanager. He's a real looker. This is a scarlet Tanager to be precise. Um, this is his very fancy uh, outfit he wears when it's um, time to, to make babies and raise the family, help raise the family a little bit. Um, but we don't see Tanager a lot because Tanager spends a lot of time way up high in the canopy, occasionally comes down to the ground, shows off a little bit. Um, but, you know, he's there and his partner, she's beautifully hidden. She's very difficult to see, but we can hear them, right? So they're still there even when we don't see them. And so Tanagers are a great example of our expanded awareness and of kind of growing our awareness and our connection by using those senses. Because I can live an entire life without looking way up high into the canopy of trees and never see this bird. But if I know the sound, like a robin with a sore throat, then I know, oh, that's my neighbor Tanager. He's back. It's usually here around May 3rd every year, Tanager comes back. When the oaks are blossoming, oak blossoms everywhere, pollen coming down, all sorts of... Uh, black flies up there and other other critters pollinating those and it's feeding like mad up there right that's just like a feast for tanager time another practice is just assume that our wild neighbors are aware of us right so when we just go outside just be like all right hmm, where's the closest animal what's what you know where are the birds where are the birds right now who's actually looking at me who heard that door open who heard that car stop who heard me get off my bike or heard me uh, drop that thing I was carrying, right? And just look around. It's not like paranoia. It's just like, oh, I'm not alone. I'm in. I'm. I'm with other neighbors right now. They're here. That really can shift things for a lot of people to just know. Yeah, you're actually not alone, and there are things that are paying attention to you, and you have the ability to potentially find and pay attention to them. Things just like paying attention to the wind. It's really helpful because that helps us understand where sounds and smells and things are carrying and moving. That helps us use our senses. Studying landscapes, whether that means like even like if you're in the courtyard of an office building and knowing where the leaves pile up, which means that's where the invertebrates pile up, which means that where the sparrows might hang out, or whether you're in a big, beautiful, you know, I don't know, Rocky Mountain landscape and understanding the south, the south facing slopes that cool first and that are great places for cougars to sun, uh, the high um, stable snowpack for the mountain goat, whatever it is, study landscapes, start to look at maps because we want to understand our neighbors and become whispers of birds and other things. We want to understand who they are. If we don't even understand who they are, what they eat, where they live, where they build their nest. It's hard to make those connections, just like meeting real neighbors. And the more sometimes, you know, I, this one's tricky because sometimes moving a lot fast is better than moving a little consistently medium speed. But anyway, sitting and listening, especially for bird folks. Us birders, we like to move on the landscape. We like to go around and check off little birds and see new ones and go to the next one. But just stopping and watching behavior and just stopping and listening can be extremely helpful and can give us a different perspective on how to make connections and better understand what's happening. And the thing I like to often do, because I'm assuming wildlife is watching me, I just ask, where is the dot, 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 whatever it is. 
So if you're in the Pacific Northwest and you're on a hike in a valley, where are the elk right now? If you're in the, if you're in Southern Appalachia, right? And it's dusk and you're on the edge of a wetland, I might ask, where's black bear or raccoon right now? Right. Or if you're in suburbia, where's deer right now? <laughs> right? This is deer. She's listening to a robin in this picture. There's a robin alarming. And her ears went straight up, turned right towards that. Yes, deer do listen to robins quite a bit. It took me a long time to figure this out as someone who um, uses deer as an important for, form of sustenance for my family. Um, they are listening to other animals and those other animals tell them when someone's coming and who they might want to avoid. <laughs> They're very, very smart this way. Invisibility is just one of deer's many, many, many skills, right? She understands how to work the world, the edgy, the little world between you and I, the place, uh, that fine edgy habitat between humans, right? And then in the more than human world. So another practice here is start to practice interpreting bird behavior. And that just means like, be curious, wonder, ask questions like, why? Why is this chickadee letting me feed it out of my hand? How did that come to be? Huh, is it every chickadee? Is this just one chicken? How much you get? Or when I'm sitting there out at the park, like why do, when the doves all sit on that wire or they sit on the top of that telephone pole, why are they always facing that certain direction, right? Or why are the starlings all turn and fly really fast in the same way? Whatever, just start to ask questions. Be curious. Curiosity is one of your best friends when trying to make these connections, for sure. All right. So the, sometimes we, I'm not going to get into all this tonight, but some of the things we'll cover in the, in the weekend too are understanding what we call five voices of birds, what's going on for them in that moment, where, if they're concerned, where's that coming from? And then to go investigate, to be, I say, be boldly curious, right? Obviously be smart about it, but um, follow your curiosity. Like if you hear something weird or you see something you don't know, like don't be lazy and give up, go look, go listen, sit still, whatever it is. <laughs> but like use that little, that little curiosity, like feed yourself with it, right? So say you're walking along, um, you're walk, I don't know, you're out to dinner, you're walking around somewhere and you hear some weird little bird-like noise. You're not even sure if it's a bird. And you're like, oh, I really I wonder what that is. But say that out loud and then be like, hey, can we go try and figure out what that is? And as long as it's somewhere safe and smart to go, like, and you feel good about it, go for it. Um, if you come home from seeing something, do some research. If you have a friend who knows a lot or likes this stuff too, talk to them, right? And then just test your instincts too. Like if you think something's happening, you think you see something like, Go try and follow through with it. If you hear a bird making a certain noise, you're like, I think there's something messing around with that bird's nest. There's that little robin and it's got that nest. I'm going to go look. Like, take your time and really look. Is there anything there? Is there a snake in the tree? Is there a cat down below? Is there a weasel in, in, in the shrub nearby? Is there, is there a crow sitting quietly watching the whole thing? It might be trying to steal an egg. Look for these things and then repeat again and again and again. And that's how we start to gather knowledge, right? That's how we start to gather experience and stories. Because birds are talking to us all the time, right? Robin sitting on a fence. It's not just to look pretty, folks. That is Papa Robin, and he's looking pretty to me. Like, he's looking, he's, what's going on? Hmm. Hmm? Excuse me? What? what? Sentinel behavior. He wants to know what's happening. He's looking out. His posture says something might be amiss, right? These Robins, not so much. Feeding, preening, washing, taking care of themselves. Everything's probably just fine. As far as they know, life is good. No worries, so to speak. And then we use our ears to listen, right? So chickadee ears sticking out on a branch looking kind of silly. Sounds like this. Dee, 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 dee. Pretty intense vocalization. Oh, chickadee, dee, 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 dee. There's a lot of D's there. Hear that one? What is chickadee telling us? And the best part is you don't have to know. You don't have to be right. Asking the question is the most important part. 
in this case, you can pop in the chat. If, oh, if you think maybe you know what they're saying, let's stop. This one was telling us, I don't like that saw what owl being really close to us. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that guy right there. It was just eat, he's eating a junko right in front of me. <laughs> nope. Mm -mm. Not comfortable. Get out. Go away. Not good. Not my neighborhood, baby. All right. Chickadees will tell us these things. They will mob. They will vocalize, right? But most of us aren't listening, right? And I'm guilty of this quite a bit too. And there's no blame or shame here. I'm not, that's not my game. It's just a fact. We're often distracted by a lot of other stuff or we're just forgetting to pay attention or whatever. Um, so, you know, you may have just grown up that way. No one told me like, listen to the birds, like a lot as a kid. I've told lots of kids that for many years, but no one told me that as a kid. Um, it's okay. And this listening does require structure and repetition. Like you got to stick to it. You got to stay at it, right? Uh, in some ways, if you really want to start to understand these stories a little bit. Like I said, we're hardwired for it, but we have to keep working at it a little bit at a time. And by doing this, we're unlocking beautiful little wild mysteries, right? So here's one a, couple, a year or two ago, just curious. I was on a phone call talking to my wife, checking in. I was working on the road and I just heard like <laughs> dog barks in the distance and <laughs> in the distance, but they were moving. Like I could visually like hear them moving. There was one there. There was one there. There was one there one there i was like man something is setting off dogs that to me is what i call bird language there's no there's no birds involved but it's like i'm tracking energy moving and i'm tracking the alarm calls in this case of domestic dogs it's like something's going through that neighborhood and they don't like it so sure enough i just ran ahead of the sound hid myself behind a bench at a bus stop and started squeaking on the back of my hand Foxes are suckers for hand squeaks, by the way. Most predators are. <laughs> Fox is a little concerned about me. I don't know what's going on. He can't quite see me. I'm hiding by the bench. So I slowly show up now and I'm like waving. Hi. It doesn't know what to do. First time we met, I'd never been to this place before. Fox is feeling me out. Not so sure. Not so sure. There's cars right around us. There's a bus going by. And Fox is there the whole time. But I wouldn't have known Fox was there if the dogs didn't tell me. And I wouldn't have heard the dogs if I wasn't trying to pay attention to birds. And I wouldn't have tried to pay attention to birds if I didn't know that we can do that. We can all be bird whispers. So that's just a little, little intro on how to be a bird whisperer tonight and how to tune into this more than human world we all share. And I'm happy to take some questions and answers questions here in a little bit. And just another reminder, you're all invited to come learn uh, with me because I'm learning too. Uh, in person uh, at the Rose Center. You can sign up there uh, the weekend of April 29th. Very excited uh, to, yeah, have a whole bunch of things I love to do on those weekends, including a lot of time outside, a lot of time being curious, some structured learning, some lectures, some uh, small group stuff, you name it. So hopefully I'll see a bunch of you there. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing and if we have questions, happy to take some. So the best way would be to put questions in the chat. And I am going to put the website <clears throat> of the program <throat> on the chat. Thanks, Fia. Mm -hmm. All right, let me keep my eye on this whole chat. And you not even, yeah, it doesn't have to be questions either, folks. If you've got other, yeah, other things you just want to share, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Someone just asked why they call goldfinches a 007. I think it's a play on the James Bond movie, Goldfinger, probably. I don't know. Who gets to decide what birds are called? It's hilarious. You know, I just say make up your own collective noun or plural noun for birds, and that's great, too. Um, oh, nice. First fox sparrow showed up today under a sunflower feeder. Oh, that's exciting. That's a cool bird, fun little bird, or fun big sparrow. Beautiful bird. Starting to migrate this time of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a text from my sister today. It just said, red wing blackbirds and grackles. So her first ones of the spring, which is, uh, you know, a bit of a beautiful spring tradition, even though we got a foot of snow on Friday and it was 17 degrees out today, <clears throat> Fahrenheit.
All right, let me go back to the answer to the chat. Oh, nice. I want to talk about, yes, wood frogs, woodpeckers. Oh, man, for years, I, there used to be the, um, that, the gray tree frog is a, is, a, is a frog I thought was a bird for almost four or five years. And I just kept going, and trying to find it and try and find it and try and find it. And I was like, man, there's a bird going at night too. This is crazy. And it's always these hot, humid nights. And then finally, I saw it one day calling during the day at like eye level. And I'm like, that's a crazy little frog. Oh my God, that's amazing. Anyway, all right. Oh, a lot of first of years are coming up here. Uh, people talking about that. Oh yes, uh, someone asked if I could list the four core practices. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good little, yes. So the first one is definitely to, um, to slow down, <laughs> right? Um, that's pretty critical. Um, uh, the second one we talked about was just use your senses right? and continue to work on those. As we get older, it's important to find ways to kind of exercise our senses, just like our body. Uh, the third one was assume wildlife is aware of you. So assume birds, mammals, everything else is probably paying attention to you as well. And the last one that I mentioned was uh, learn to interpret bird behavior. Um, so that's getting to know the birds and understanding a little bit about their stories and things like that. So, yeah. All right. Do you think, uh, oh, can it, severe overpopulation of white-tailed deer have a, yeah. absolutely. I mean, no, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm not just speaking specifically to deer, but anytime we have, you know, what I would judge as large imbalances, overpopulations or, Whenever things are out of balance, you know, we are nothing but our connections. And, you know, if anything we're learning is that everything is interrelated and connected. So especially um, it, it deer, it's a, so this example, I grew up in suburban New Jersey, so I know a bit about this. Overpopulations of deer result in the destruction of the understory. So birds that nest in low shrubs and understory areas in the forest have almost no chance of surviving unless they can live in things like barberry and things that deer tend to avoid other kind of uh, challenging invasive plants to consume. So yeah, for sure um, happens. Yeah. Is climate change messing with the way birds migrate? I mean, climate change definitely affects how birds migrate. Um, I would say it's, it, it's not so much in my judgment and what I understand from a lot of the scientific literature is it's not so much about timing of the birds migrating, it's about the timing of the foods the birds need during migration. That's the trick. When are things flowering, budding, fruiting, seeding, pollinating that they're depending upon, that, that their ancestors depended upon for millennia, and now all of a sudden those things aren't available? It really tests the resilience of, of an individual, of a family, of a flock, of a species to be able to adapt to those things again and again and again. So that's one of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Nice. Ravens inform me of a red tail. Yes, they should do. Uh, do you have tips for someone who wants to facilitate bird language? Um, what did your mentor, John, do that inspired you the most? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to try and bring um, an awareness to the language of birds to other people, um, role model curiosity. Learn alongside them and do it regularly. So start like a little club, like a little like bird language club or a like a talking with birds club, whatever you wanna call it. And just go out there with the intention of, we wanna learn from the birds and start to go to the same place again and again and again, ideally around the same time of day again and again. Like even if it's like every Saturday at 2 p.m. or every Sunday at 6 a.m., whatever it is, and you'll start to pick up knowledge of place. And knowledge of place helps you understand baseline behaviors, and that helps you understand breaks in baselines. That helps you understand priorities of birds, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of layers there to unpack, but um, there is, um, yeah. And I mean, and if so, yeah, Tieran, if you're familiar with John Young's work, he did do a couple of, he did have some media on that topic on facilitating bird language groups, I think too, that for a while, I remember there used to be some old CDs back in the early 2000s. So that's probably available somewhere too. Oh, do I have a favorite bird? Uh, well, I mean, the harlequins are pretty awesome right there. It depends on the time of year. It depends on a lot of stuff. 
Uh, no, I don't really have a favorite bird. Uh, whatever bird is around me and it's happening right now, it gets me excited. Uh, let's see. Someone asked about timber doodles, also known as uh, the American woodcock. Um, any tips for seeing them during the day? Uh, yeah, good question. So woodcocks in the spring display on the what we call the painting grounds where they come out and uh, and the noise you often hear is the or paint kind of noise, but at dusk, you'll often hear, and if you're lucky, see a when they're up in their flight and they start to drop down. They have little wing whistles that happens with their feathers. And they land and right. So that's often the noise we hear. Um, and so they're easy to spot at dusk. They're out in the open in fields, right? And you can actually get pretty close to them sometimes too. But during the day, you want to go to leafy, wetter, forested areas that have a lot of thick cover, a lot of um, moisture on the ground, because they mostly eat a lot of earthworms these days. They eat a lot of invertebrates. It's mostly earthworms. Walk really slowly around places with earthworms that are wet really slowly, because their, their, their camouflage and their technique is don't move until I'm about to be stepped on. <laughs> so they're hard to see, really hard to see. But that's what I would suggest. And sit still in that place. Oh, someone asked me a biggest year number. I'm not a really a, a, I'm not really that much of a compu computative birder or quantitative birder. Um, but this year I did set a goal, just stay in like the top 10 of my little eBird county here, just as like something to keep me going and connected and making new connections. And I think I just had over 200 birds in my county this year um, that I identified and saw, which was great. It was fun, it was exciting. So um, yeah. So I don't know. I guess maybe that's my biggest year. I don't know. <laughs> um, so you have a couple minutes left here. Nice. Thoughts on bird rehabilitation centers? Um, I think in general, wildlife can use a lot of help. And I say that mostly because a lot of the, um, I work very closely with the wildlife rehabilitation right down the road for me. The vast majority of the birds that come in there are coming in there as a result of a negative interaction with the human world. So I kind of feel like we have an obligation in many senses to do our best to mitigate that whenever possible. Um, it's not perfect, doesn't happen all the time. So yeah, I'm grateful that there are people and places who have the knowledge and the ability to care for our wild neighbors, just like we would other neighbors. So yeah, grateful for those. Dan, I think you missed one question about whether raven and owl can live on the same tree. <laughs> There's always hope, folks. There's always hope. Don't know. Not usually. Depends on the owl and the raven, but uh, yeah, who knows? All righty. Well, with that, we are at the end of our time. Anything, uh, Tia, you want to wrap up here with? I just, I have entered your the website um, okay. link for your program, and I hope people okay. will come because I, I want to come. We're going to have a good time. I yep. like to have fun. I like to have fun when I learn. <laughs> I like people to have fun. Um, and again, it's not about, I mean, I think, yeah, the word expert is problematic. It's about learning together. It's about continuing to be curious, um, sharing stories, finding connection with also like-minded people who are interested in these things. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope folks will at least consider it. And um, if that doesn't work for you, um, yeah, there's also other ways to to follow what I'm up to. And so I hope to reconnect in some way with you all and actually meet some of you at some point in time in person. Thank you so yeah. much for being here. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah. See you at Roe, hopefully. All righty. Good night. <laughs>